We're going to give people a couple of more minutes. I'm so happy to see all of you. It's been a, a difficult week, raw, rough, but I'm so happy that we're all here. I'm looking forward to this topic. Diversity in clinical trials is a very personal, urgent, and uh, relevant to me, and I hope it is for you too. So we're going to give people a couple of more minutes to come on into the Zoom conversation, and then we'll get started. Hi, Edie. I'm on, I'm on as well. This is Aida. I'm so glad that you can make it. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for hosting this. Hi, Edie. This is Ralat. Hello, Miss. How are you doing? I'm good. <laughs> Who yeah. else is on right now? Hi, Aditi here. You know most. I can put my glasses on now. See the name. <laughs> <laughs> And thank you for sending the um, information. Actually, my two o'clock got canceled and I really wanted to attend it, so thank you. I'm glad that you're able to make it. It's nice okay. to see you, Aditi. I'm sorry? I was just saying it's nice to see you, Aditi. Yes, it is. good to hear from you like too, I guess. See, we have some new names and faces. This is great. Good afternoon, Edie. This is Theo Hill. Theo, good to see you. How are you doing? Good, good, good. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Congratulations on the graduation. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I appreciate that. I'm glad it's over. I know you have to be. Iman, thank you for joining us from British Columbia. Love having you here. It's a pleasure being here. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> I'm trying to see who's come the furthest. It's uh, probably from Switzerland. Let's see if Omri is still on here. He's in Switzerland. So he beat you out, I think. He beat me, yeah. <laughs> So Zach, just cue us up when you're ready for us to go. We're good. We got a good group and we're ready to go, Edie. So take it away. Awesome. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Edie Stringfellow. I'm the Director of Diversity and Inclusion with the Massachusetts Biotechnology Council, but we call it MassBio for short. I'd love to welcome you to today's topic, which is about diversity and clinical trials. It's, it's very personal urgent and relevant, not just to me, but I'm quite sure for everyone on this line, patient advocacy and patient outcomes is what we do. We're passionate about it and that's what drives us. But we have to figure out a way to get more people from different backgrounds to participate into the clinical trials. So I would like to, before I introduce you to our featured guest, just go over a couple of ground rules. We're going to uh, mute, I'm going to ask you to mute your audio and your video. For the first 20 minutes or so, I'm going to do the Q&A with Dr. James, but you're always welcome to ask a question or to chat anytime. But the last 20 minutes is when we're definitely going to have it open for Q&A with the audience. We're all good? Awesome. So Dr. James, thank you so much for joining us. Is it okay if I call you Regina? Absolutely. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Our guest today is Dr. Regina James. She's the Chief Medical Officer with 2M Clinical. Regina, if you can tell us a little bit about your background, your journey, and, uh, and what you do at 2M. I love the statement, the journey. That could take like forever, right? <laughs> but I won't. <laughs> so uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so glad you were able to take some time today to join this webinar. 
Uh, again, my name is Regina James. I'm the Chief Medical Officer here at 2M Clinical. Uh, by way of background, I'm a pediatrician and child and adolescent psychiatrist. I've actually been with 2M Clinical for two years. Um, and before that, I was actually with the National Institutes of Health for about 20 years. Um, wow. How did I start? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> so I actually uh, came to NIH about 20 years ago, and I started doing, well, after finishing my training, I actually trained uh, at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation, um, mm -hmm. and then came to the National Institutes of Health and started working first at the clinical center, uh, where I was engaged in hands-on clinical trials, primarily with the pediatric population uh, with uh, CNS-type uh, therapeutic interventions. So did that for a bit, and primarily uh, phase three, sometimes two, but primarily phase three, uh, okay. but two to four. Um, and then transitioned into other various uh, uh, opportunities at the National Institutes of Health. I was at the National Institute of Mental Health. I was at the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. And I was at the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. And in those capacities, uh, I was able to lead a number of programs, both domestically and internationally, uh, research programs, primarily in terms of internationally, uh, primarily in Sub-Saharan Africa, India, South and Central America. And at the time at NIH, I was also afforded the opportunity to work on a number of uh, high visibility uh, programs and projects. Um, as many of you know, the uh, Precision Medicine Initiative, the NIH All of Us program, uh, the ABCD study, the LS Brain and Cognition Development Study, um, human hereditary and health in Africa, H3 Africa studies. So I really had a wonderful experience uh, in my 20 year tenure at the National Institutes of Health. Uh, and again, transitioned over to 2M Clinical, uh, really attracted to that particular uh, small firm, a uh, small CRO, uh, meeting with both the, the husband and wife. It's actually, um, 2M Clinical is actually run by a husband and wife. Uh, duo, Drs. Martin and Lisa Mar uh, Marcus, and the husband is the uh, CEO and founder, Dr. Marcus Martin, and the wife is the president, and she is a PharmD. So together, they really had a nice, strong foundation of public health, uh, having uh, extensive experience that she has in the biopharmaceutical industry, uh, with really a keen eye toward uh, inclusion uh, particularly around clinical research and clinical trials, which was a big attraction for me. Uh, therefore, I, I came to 2M Clinical, and in the last two years, we worked uh, in the federal space, probably over 23 federal agencies. Uh, we worked in the biopharmaceutical space, Novo Nordisk comes to mind, and we worked with um, HPOs. Uh, so we've been able to do a lot, and uh, yeah. Okay. Well, speaking of doing a lot, I have to say that if it wasn't for PTC Therapeutics who's sponsoring Makeshift Happen, they are powering Makeshift Happen for the month of June. So I'm so grateful that PTC team members are here and they're able to participate and able to bring to make Makeshift Happen live for all of us. So thank you, PTC Therapeutics, for being just as passionate as Dr. James about <laughs> clinical trials. And speaking of which, let's find out why Dr. James feels as if clinical trials is so important. Uh, clinical trials and particularly diversity, I think, in, in clinical trials is extremely important to me. Um, as a physician and as a researcher, um, seeing patients, you want to make sure that the, the drugs and or devices uh, that are being tested are actually being tested on people that they're meant to help. Okay. Right. So that, I mean, I think that's the bottom line. And in terms of the trials, we really, you know, I really feel strongly that we want them aligned with the real world population. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and those who represent the current disease state. So if you are doing trials on uh, antihypertensive meds, one would anticipate that there would be a sufficient representation of those who are significantly impacted by cardiovascular disease. Um, 
just from a scientific standpoint, I think it's important to be able to conduct meaningful analysis, to be able to compare the relevant groups. So if you're talking about racial ethnic groups, to be able to compare, are there differences among racial ethnic groups? Is there differences among women versus men in terms of sex? Is there differences in terms of across the lifespan, the pediatric population? Pedi you know, kids are not small adults. That's a whole different, you know, ball game. Um, women are not, you know, uh, small men. <laughs> you know, it's a whole different ball game. To, to, so to, to be able to really tease out sort of the safety and efficacy uh, that may vary among racial and ethnic groups, among sexes, and among age, age range, I think is, is really, really important. So from, again, from a clinical standpoint, as well as from a scientific standpoint, um, I think it's extremely important, again, particularly as a, as a physician working with patients, you want to be able to know that the medications that you're utilizing and recommended, recommending are actually have been tested, at least, and we have some information about safety and efficacy uh, among the groups. Well, as, if you're talking about safety and efficacy among the groups, what are some of the federal guidelines or policies that are making most of the impact right now on diversity and clinical research? So um, the National Institutes of Health and the Food and Drug Administration are the primary federal agencies that are involved in regulations slash guidelines. So for the National Institutes of Health, they actually, due to the Revitalization Act of 1993, they are actually mandated uh, to include women and minorities uh, within any NIH-funded uh, clinical research or clinical trial. And also with the 21st Century Cures Act uh, of 2016, that actually sort of added another layer, basically requiring that phase three studies submit analysis on these groups to clinicaltrials.gov. So with NIH funded grants, it's a mandate. It's actually mm -hmm. required in order to be funded. Given that most of the research and development resources are really coming from the industry side, that does, so the NIH policy doesn't necessarily apply. So that's where the Food and Drug Administration comes in with their guidelines. And so based on the, um, they have a, the, the Safety and Innovation Act, which I think was around 2012. So with that, they recommended, recommended, requested, that applications submitted for marketing should include data on race and ethnicity, age, sex differences, et cetera, uh, and have safety and effectiveness data on these groups. Again, so these are recommendations and suggestions. They're not mandates, they're not statutory, they're, you know, there's nothing legal binding it, um, but they do provide published, they have published guidelines for industry uh, to really help them along in terms of how to facilitate getting this type of data and et cetera. And they also have the snapshot program uh, where you can, you know, it's publicly available where you can actually look at highlights of demographic data from um, FDA studies. So those are the real sort of guidelines that are out there. Okay, well, with the, if you take into context the guidelines, one question mm -hmm. that I find needs balance is we're looking for more therapies to get to market faster. But mm -hmm. if we are looking for diversity and it's hard to get more people from diverse backgrounds to participate, do you think it's almost a catch-22 or a double-edged sword or we want to get the drugs to market faster, but we have to record have to recruit people with diverse backgrounds. So if we get there faster, are we uh, missing equity? And if we waiting to fully incorporate more people with diverse backgrounds into the trial, is that slowing it down and making it more costly? So that, that's, a <laughs> that's a very interesting question. Um, understanding that it's a business and also balancing that with the ultimate goal is to really, you know, improve health and improve lives with these various drugs and devices. Um, I do understand and appreciate uh, timeliness, efficiency, and effectiveness. Uh, but at the same time, I think we all can appreciate uh, quality and generalizability of the information that's coming from it. Um, so I think it's really, uh, 
a discussion or a dance, so to speak, with uh, biopharmaceutical companies and really engaging them in conversations early on uh, to help them set the timeline and integrate within that timeline some of the pitfalls or potential barriers that they think that they might face as they try to engage uh, various populations. So for example, here at 2M Clinical, when we work with a client, we like to get involved early at the time when the protocol is being developed or feasibility stage so we can actually have that conversation and ask those questions, uh, be able to outline what variables do you think or, you know, are important, which groups are you trying to target, what do you anticipate might be some of the barriers or pitfalls, and really sort of outline it, um, sort of make a list in terms of most important, least important, put costs that are associated with those particular outreach efforts or whatever next to the list, and then really have a, a consensus on, okay, so before you move forward, we know before you set your timeline, what is it that we can do and what is it that we can't do from the beginning? Um, and so I think it can happen uh, both ways. I think that having that conversation in the beginning, like I said, in the early stages, um, and also, I don't wanna say breaking the myths, but really addressing maybe some of the preconceived notions about what it takes to engage uh, diverse communities. And, you know, it's education on both sides, not only for the bar pharmaceutical company, but, you know, for those who are the participants as well, the investigators as well, just really understanding and, and sort of breaking through the preconceived notions of what does it really mean to actually engage a diverse uh, population. And, um, yeah, I'll stop at that point. Okay. <laughs> I know that's a lot. Edie, um, can I add something? Yeah, hop on in. Yeah, this is Aida. So I work for, I'm the head of diversity for Parrot Self, which is a clinical research organization headquartered in Boston and also in RTP. And um, about a month ago, uh, Janssen, which is a part of J&J, uh, &J, mm -hmm. reached out to us to participate in a collaboration with, with, with other CROs, so other competitors, and also other pharma companies. So I think we have Takata, uh, we have uh, Merck, we have so many um, GSK. And so we, we looked at, we had a summit for two days mm -hmm. and we looked at where were the opportunities, what were the barriers. And mm -hmm. so we actually have a collaboration. If any of you are interested in being part of this, uh, send me your email. Edie has my email. But we've actually, I mean, for years and years, um, uh, we have discussed the diversity in clinical trials. Mm -hmm. And I got involved in ensuring women um, through some collaboration with Mark years ago. And now, you know, women are included. More mm -hmm. and more, more women are included. And, but the, we needed to work on ethnicity. And I'm so delighted that J&J &J stepped up. And so um, we were... were we're actually doing something. And so at Paracel, we formed a diversity and clinical trial subcommittee mm -hmm. uh, because there's things we could do, like we could do awareness. Like there was a lot yes. around training, awareness of the, of the monitors, of the patient and the, the recruiting, the folks that recruit for the volunteers. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's so many things we could do on our own without waiting for our clients to tell us what to do, you know? And so, one of the suggestions was for companies to start a diversity and clinical trials organization within mm -hmm. the organization, like a little subcommittee to work on some low hanging fruit. So I just wanted to share that, that we've begun and I'm really excited. And, and you know what, I'm, I'm Hispanic and, um, and I know where the Hispanic community hangs out in the States. Mm -hmm. And, and so I know how to reach my parents and my cousins and, um, and so we talked about, you know, that we may not be going to the best places to educate the community on participation in clinical trials. There's just like a lot around communication, communication of the pharma companies and their folks. And, and I also noticed that there was a lot of people of different ethnicities that have reached a high level in these companies and they're pushing it. And so, and they're getting the attention from their leaders. And so there's the commitment. So I just wanted to to you know uh, acknowledge those folks 
that that are working in these companies that want to see this happen. And I and I, I 100% concur with you, and it's really great to hear uh, that that's going on. And um, I know uh, here at to a clinical with, with our colleagues that awareness and education and ex is extremely important. Um, also leveraging uh, networks of individuals and organizations who already have a connection with the community uh, makes a huge difference. I'll give one example. My uh, mother uh, was a patient of uh, Dr. Elijah Saunders. I don't know if any of you know him. He was a well-known African-American cardiologist, physician, researcher, um, who uh, worked out of the University of Maryland. Um, and because of her relationship with her physician, Dr. Saunders, uh, because of his relationship and engagement with research and the University of Maryland, uh, to engage her in a clinical trial would be a no-brainer. She trusts her physician. She was comfortable with the University of Maryland. And so really, again, leveraging those types of established relationships can go a long way as opposed to try to building uh, new relationships. And, you know, here at Tuam Clinical, we definitely, as you have already demonstrated in, in, in your arena, we have those connections uh, with diverse principal investigators who already have established relationships with their patients. We have those relationships with organizations, whether it's advocacy groups, uh, which is very important, um, other professional groups, um, academic centers who already have relationships. Those relationships are important because the issue of trust is, is a major concern. And so you wanna make sure that um, you sort of uh, allay the fe a lot of fears and build those relationships based on something that is already established. So it's so wonderful to hear uh, that the companies are doing that and moving in that direction because I think that it's going to be key, education awareness and building on those networks. So thank you for sharing. I have a question for you. Um, how, as sponsors, what can we do to help increase health literacies in the communities that we need more to volunteer into diversity clinical trial? And, uh, well, I think it's important to work again with some of the networks, like some of the advocacy groups, some of the established organizations, um, and develop awareness programs, education programs, uh, working with local uh, healthcare facilities, uh, with um, uh, health uh, fairs, et cetera, to really show your face, start to engage yourself, but really connect yourself with people who are already connected because you still will be an outsider even if you do host a, a fair in an area which they don't know you, right? So really connecting yourself with someone who's already connected with those type of activities. Building relationships uh, is, is just so key. And again, and then and leveraging that to be able to educate people about what is a clinical trial, what are the different phases for, what is going to be the advantage of me actually engaging in a clinical trial? Is it a personal gain? Is it going to help, you know, is it an altruistic sort of effort? Uh, but just really educating people, what does it mean to engage in a clinical trial? And is it going to cost me any money? Does my insurance actually cover it? What if I don't have insurance? To so be able to have those open, transparent dialogues uh, with potential participants, I think is really important. Okay, well, we have a question from Dr. Abdullah with uh, Sanofi, go ahead. Hi, yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Raul Abdullah. I'm a clinical research director at Sanofi. So, uh, you know, I wanted to just make a couple of points. Um, I think one thing that really is, is very important, and uh, Ada said it from Paraxel, and, and, and it's already been mentioned several times, is the uh, reaching out to the investigators. Um, I did a study back when I was uh, in, uh, at Mayo in which we found that patient-provided concordance was quite important for patients being able to complete their uh, uh, primary care health assessments. But this extends to the clinical trial. And because of implicit bias, many minority uh, populations aren't even offered uh, clinical trials. So, you know, it's, we always talk about, you know, trying to get the patients educated, which I think is very important, 
But oftentimes, you know, some of the barriers are the actual providers and the investigators. And what I do find, you know, in general for most companies is that, you know, we go to the same investigators <laughs> often and they're not diverse. Um, unfortunately, and so this really leaves out many young investigators, women, female investigators, and people of color. So we really have to do something about that. Eli Lilly, I know they hold, they were holding uh, um, an investigator, uh, diversity investigator kind of summit every year. It's like an educational course to really get oncologists from various backgrounds um, uh, into the clinical trial kind of system. And I think that was amazing. And we need more of that um, because really uh, the providers, the investigators, they're the ones with access to the diverse populations. Um, and we know this, we know that black providers tend to take care of the majority black patients. And, and so, and some of these patients will seek them out. This is just what happens in terms of uh, where they're practicing. So um, I, I do think that really honing in and improving the diversity of the investigator pool is essential for any diversity effort across any pharmaceutical company or across multiple companies. So, and I, and I thank you. I thank you for the comments and I, I truly agree. And if we think about it and step back a little bit, it actually is sort of a multi-stakeholder engagement. So there's a responsibility of the sponsors, there's a responsibility on the investigators, there's a responsibility on the communities. And I think you've clearly highlighted the role of the investigators, right? Encouraging them, encouraging them to be more proactive to engage diverse uh, populations. And as you mentioned, and I concur, in many cases, individuals from diverse communities are simply not asked to be a part of a clinical trial, right? So really being proactive with the investigators to do just that. Um, and, and again, you mentioned encouraging investigators to move beyond the sites that they typically work with. Um, and as, as you mentioned that, I was thinking about uh, something that I'd read recently. I think it was the chief diversity officer for Genentech who was highlighting that they have a um, phase three double blind placebo control study coming out in reference to treatment for COVID-19 disease. I think it's, I think it's called Impacta. And so what she had highlighted that in this case, the hospitals that they are leveraging in terms of the sites are the hospitals that are going to reach underserved communities. And they're using sites that aren't typically utilized. Uh, in their clinical trials. So to really highlight what you just said, I think, you know, the biopharma companies are really beginning to hear that and move positively in that direction. We're really encouraging them to go beyond the typical sites. It's easy to go to the same sites, obviously, because it just makes it easier, right? Quicker and more efficient. But then you may not necessarily get the broadened population and participation that, that you would like to have. Um, and again, you mentioned site staff being, you know, reflective of the communities that you're trying to engage, which is, I agree, really important. Uh, when I was at the clinical center and working with the children and, and their families and engaging them uh, in clinical trials, I mean, and this is just anecdotal, um, but many of the parents, we had uh, myself, who was African-American, uh, we had uh, two Latinos who were part of the staff and one Asian American. And so the staff was diverse and the population of the children that we engaged was also diverse. And they really appreciated the fact and maybe there were just some things culturally that they felt comfortable talking to one of us versus the other, which was just fine. So I really do think that having or at least being cognizant of and making the effort to have you know, diverse representation among your site staff is extremely important. But it's just not the investigators and, it, and it's just not the communities being educated. But as uh, Edie brought up in the beginning, you know, what can we do as sponsors? So sponsors also, it's, it's, multi, it's a multi-level sort of coming together as stakeholders and really working together. It's not gonna be one versus the other. I think they're all very important. We have a question from Dr. Shri Butts with Biogen. Go ahead. Thank you. I, I do want to say that uh, I'm glad to hear some of the common, um, I think, I think uh, Dr. James, it would be appropriate to say myths 
because there are some ways to address this without it being a mammoth effort and taking 10 years. So we've talked about recruitment, we've talked about awareness and education to those who participate. We've also talked about investigators being appropriate. I wanna talk about study design. Can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about what you've seen in terms of inclusion exclusion criteria with studies that may, because that's the other myth that I hear is that, oh, our inclusion exclusion criteria are so strict and, and people from minority communities have all of these um, comorbidities so they wouldn't be able to participate. So what's been your experience around trial design? And that's interesting. Um, so it is true in the first three phases, um, investigators tend to look for people who, you know, essentially only have the disease that they're trying to target and they're healthy otherwise, right, in the first three phases. Um, my, my response to that is we, you know, again, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, we do need to think about real world populations. Um, and it's interesting because if you think about also, I think payers, you know, insurance companies, et cetera, that that's one of their issues as well. I mean, the phase three uh, results and, you know, the, the outcomes of the phase three trials are, are good, but the populations that they're being tested on aren't, aren't real, you know, and for all intents and purposes, don't really reflect their health plan membership. So how helpful is it then for payers to, to really have this as well? Um, and so we do have to, I think, really look again at how stringent these inclusion and exclusion criteria are and try to be a little bit more flexible. And I believe also in the FDA guidelines, that is one of the suggestions or recommendations is for investigators to be a little bit more flexible with their inclusive uh, and inclusion and exclusion criteria as you move forward. And it's funny that you asked me that question. I was just having a dialogue with a colleague of mine here at 2M Clinical. Um, and my question was, because most of the trials that I've done were primarily, you know, phase three, and they were with the pediatric population and some phase uh, four, but if in fact, the inclusion exclusion criteria is the argument in terms of why diverse populations, whether it's race, ethnicity, sex, et cetera, are not included, then what's the excuse for phase four? Because that's really supposed to be, you know, the drug is now marketed, they're following people who are, you know, having the meds. They want to see, like, what are some of the major adverse effects uh, in the real world population. So now, so now, what's the reason? So I'm not quite sure if the inclusion exclusion criteria being so stringent is ultimately really helpful in the long term. So that would be my comment. Okay. Um, can you give me your take on to get more people involved from diverse backgrounds into the clinical trials? What is 2M Clinical doing or what should we be doing more in regards to digital health, incorporating more remote and uh, virtual trials, especially during this time? Right, you know, especially during this time, right? Yeah. It's interesting because <laughs> I think, you know, with COVID-19, um, you know, many people are essentially being forced to do more of, of the remote data collection, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think in terms of expanding or broadening the population who's engaged in clinical research and really leveraging the concept of telehealth and telemedicine could be helpful. And let me say why. So, it, you know, one of the barriers to clinical trial recruitment tends to be around, I wouldn't say convenience, but just traveling, trying to get to the academic center, the cost, the time, et cetera. So if the trial is more remote, it does make it more convenient. So you could do remote screening, you could do remote consenting, remote monitoring, you could have someone come into the home to collect the labs, you could have medication shipped curbside, and depending upon the therapeutic area, you can even do remote visits. Like if it's a dermatologic study, for example, it's probably easier to do a remote visit. So there are advantages advantages and that could in fact make it more convenient for more populations uh, to engage in clinical trials. Uh, but we also have to be cons you know, cognizant of the potential, I would call them potential barriers. Um, and it is really around um, technology, you know, 
does the community that you're working with have access to the technology that you need? Is the technology that you're going to use reliable? There's going to be, you know, time needed to actually train the staff, not only the, the, the site staff and the physicians, but the patients are using the technology. You know, so there's that piece as well. Uh, but I do think that it can have the potential to broaden the opportunity for other populations to engage in clinical research. Um, but when it comes to uh, populations who have not been typically engaged, uh, convenience is a factor, um, but there are other factors as well that still need to be considered. Um, and one of them, I think we all know, is the issue around trust. Uh, in the issue around just having established relationships with them in addition to understanding really what a clinical trial is and, and, and what does it all mean. But I do think that moving in that direction can be uh, an additional plus for broadening uh, participation. And I was just gonna add, I was reading uh, recently, I think it was a McKinsey report that, that, that noted that during this time of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, consumers are actually using um, you know, technology more, like telemedicine more. I think it had gone up from like last year's like 11% and now it's like 46%. And even providers are seeing more patients you know, via telehealth. Um, and actually uh, CMS has actually uh, temporarily approved more services uh, during this time period of the pandemic through telehealth. I think it's about 80 services uh, in the categories for CMS. So I think it's definitely a move in the right direction, but we just don't want to forget some of the other factors that do uh, serve as barriers for participation. If there was anything that you could implement where there's more collaboration between the sponsors, regulators, uh, investigators, the community, what can we all be doing to move the needle forward? Communication. <laughs> I think it's, you know, I think it's truly being able to, because it, it is sort of a, a, a multi-layer uh, issue. I mean, it's, you can't just point your finger at one versus mm -hmm. the other. It is going to take sort of a group effort and an actual will to want to do it. Uh, so on the side of the sponsors, on the side of the investigators, uh, and on the side of the consumers. Uh, and I, I would also say, I, I, I don't know if I say I hate to say this, but, you know, I know that, uh, you know, most of the research and development resources are really, you know, under the industry umbrella and the guidelines that are available to them are more suggestions and recommendations. I just wonder in my dreams if these recommendations became mandates, uh, would we be seeing what we see right now? Do you think we will be better at accomplishing some of our uh, recruitment goals and increasing our timelines and doing a better job if we had more people throughout the whole clinical trial cycle from more diverse backgrounds, from the researcher to the CNAs to the CRCs, all the way up to the top to the PIs? Do you think having more of a diverse uh, workforce working with the communities will help more participation from those communities? I, yeah, I definitely think it would help. And when defining diverse as not only race and ethnicity, Everything. but also sex, et cetera, I, I definitely do. I think different people bring different perspectives to the table. And so therefore different discussions will happen. Different things will be brought to light. Uh, uh, so for example, when, when I talked about one of the things that we do here at Twim Clinical is really work with the client and sort of outline, what do you think of the barriers rank those barriers, attach a cost to those barriers, and then determine which ones do you want to actually deal with and which ones do you don't. If different people with diverse backgrounds are at the table, you're gonna get a different ranking and, and a different idea of what's important and what's not. So I think things would actually go in different directions, having those different perspectives at the table. And also with, those, with diverse representation, you also will hopefully increase the likelihood of diverse networks, right? So that means you could be connected to different communities, 
uh, not necessarily, you know, again, whether it's an African American community, a Latino community, an Asian community, the elderly community, LGBTQ community, whatever, if you have that diverse representation, you're probably increasing the likelihood of you being able to actually reach out to those uh, communities to engage them and, and form a relationship with them. Okay, well, let's open up the questions to the audience now and see what's on everyone else's mind. Uh-oh. Hi. <laughs> I hear a voice, but I don't see it. I don't see the person. <laughs> Hi, this is Aditi. Um, oh, there you are. A great discussion. And um, actually, I think the point was raised before and working in rare disease space, I think it's the same challenge already. There are not enough patients who meet the inclusion criteria. And I see the value of making it diverse, um, but it's a struggle to, um, you know, enroll patients and have some good readout in small pool of patients having not enough diversity in a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what do you, do you think that that also applies uh, to phase four? Um, I will say, again, you are the expert, please tell me. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, but, I don't think so, but I, I you know, uh, it, it, if in fact, you know, that's the drug has been approved, it's post-marketing, you're really following patients who are on the, yeah. you know, so, and, and so they should have a little bit more in terms of real world expectations of their health status. So oh, yeah. if in fact the inclusion and exclusion criteria are a hindrance per se uh, in the beginning, then it shouldn't really be in phase four. No. I would think. Totally One thing can help if everyone can turn back on their audio and video. So when you ask the question, I'll be able to see you better <laughs> that way. Amana, you have a question? Um, I did. Thank you so much, Regina, for talking about a lot of the things that really call out to me as well. And I'm, I'm in a, um, I used to be in big CRO. I'm now in mid-sized CRO. Um, I'm actually a regulator. So um, when we're speaking to a lot of sponsor companies, for example, you know, and you're right, it is all about early engagement and getting the patient voice, maybe, where, like, you know, we need to talk to the sponsors a little bit more about, you know, thinking about the patient voice, whether it's pediatric, rare, diverse, you know, it's the whole mm -hmm. kind of, I see the same kind of pattern, right? You know, the same conversations we need to have. Are we, you know, you, you brought up an interesting point about, um, the, you know, the guideline, they're just guidelines, right? Mm -hmm. But are we only going to get true action if they are mandated? I really think about that a lot because, you know, here we were talking about, for example, um, virtual trials right in this industry everyone was talking about it it's a not it was a nice to have let's be honest right but now <laughs> since, since the pandemic came in mm -hmm. we were forced to pivot mm -hmm. right? accordingly it was yeah well i'll think about it but oh god extra cost involved and more logistics and mm -hmm. you're gonna slow down my trial you know i don't, I don't want that so mm -hmm. do we or should we as a collective be speaking to regulatory agencies and advocating for a push to have you know these guidances and recommendations which fda nih is brilliant they have them i don't see any other agencies have them let me tell you all across the world but should we be pushing for that you know to make them mandated because isn't i don't know change is good but it's not enough right but do we need to push that really hard as well so sponsors have that expectation as well I'm a bit of a rebel as well, right? So. Yeah, I am too, and I'm trying to keep that down. But <laughs> no. <laughs> so I and as I said, in my dreams, and if I could, you know, w one would hope in a perfect world that, from a uh, health and ethical standpoint, you know, we'd want to do what's right for, you know, uh, but sometimes. Um, as, as with NIH did with, you know, me and Danian, um, you know, I'll shrug my shoulders and I think we're on the same wing. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just, I have that frustration because, you know, I, I, you know, we're all kind of like, we all come from different backgrounds. We've got sponsors, CROs, you know, individuals and what have you, but 
you know, we want to do the best, right? Mm -hmm. We try to do the best, but ultimately then it comes down to, no, I need, I've got strict inclusion, inclu exclusion criteria, no time is money, um, no, I haven't got the time to do this, maybe mm -hmm. we'll think about doing this next time. And next time doesn't come. Never comes. And, and, and the reality of it is, it is a business, and yeah. it is about efficiency, time, and money. Um, but I think that's where having different voices at the table early on could yeah. potentially have an impact because you can't do it after the fact, you know, once yeah. you get the, once you get the ball rolling, forget it, it's gone. Yeah. Right. But if you begin to set these policies early on or begin to engage early on or have people, uh, as Edie mentioned, from various backgrounds and all levels uh, mm. of, of, of moving this agenda forward, you know, I'm sure that can make a difference. And as you mentioned, uh, Aman, uh, really advocating for something that has a little bit more bite yeah. than a suggestion or a recommendation. Thank you. Does someone else have a question? Well, one thing I like to do, again, I thank everyone for participating. This has been a, a very rough week for everyone. It's been raw for a lot of us too. Uh, thank Hello. you so much. Oh. oh, we have one more question. You, Edie, it's Anne-Marie. I'm not sure you're hearing me. Anne-Marie from Pfizer? Hi, Anne-Marie. I don't see you, but I can hear you now. Thank you. I'm on the phone, actually. My, my audio on my computer is not working. So quick question. Yeah. So regarding, regarding the telehealth, um, so again, during this, this period of COVID-19, you know, I, I, I know this is becoming, you know, more of a, of a trend. And I, I do agree for, for that diverse populations where sort of the, the distance and, you know, the socioeconomic background, you know, is a barrier. And so that might create some opportunities for, for, for participants um, to, to get involved because now they can do things, you know, through telehealth. But I'm wondering, sort of a catch-22 here, do you see those televisits possibly sort of moving the needle backwards on the trust issue? Um, because I think, you know, as you said, a very important part of this is the, the relationship building. And for patients not having that face-to-face -face contact with, you know, the investigators and those who, you know, are providing, uh, you know, the, the services during the trial, do you think there might be less trust if patients are on the phone with, with the investigators? Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting question, and I think it really comes down to providing patients, as you were if you were treating them, with options. You provide the patient with options of, you know, we can, we do have an academic center, or we have a site that you can actually visit if it's more convenient, if you like to see us in person. We also have available, you know, an opportunity for you to really just be in your home and we could do, you know, video or remote visits. We'd really like for you to be engaged in this, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so you tell me, how do you feel? What would be best for you? Would it be best for you to do this more remotely? Would it be more convenient for you? Or, what, you know, if they had an option, yeah. like when you go to the doctor, you know what I'm saying? You know, you could take yeah. this or you can do this. So realistically, when you walk out of that door, what is it that you're going to more likely do? And then let me help you move in that direction. Excellent answer. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. And thank you so much. This, is, this was a great discussion. Oh, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Rachel, do you have a question? No. Nope. Nope. So can, um, uh, Edie, I have a question. Go ahead. I wanted to go back to Aditi's point about rare diseases because something that I'm concerned about is rare diseases are, um, and, and I was at NIH uh, also, so I'm, so I'm a little bit familiar with, I'm actually very familiar <laughs> with the clinical center studies. And okay. I recall rare diseases are something that only the most well 
informed individuals knew to go and find out what their rare disease was. And there are some diseases that I question how rare they really are. If you were to go out into the minority communities and let them know these are some things that are uh, symptoms or representative of these rare diseases, if they're seeing investigators or physicians who are saying, okay, well, because you're African American or Latin X, um, you can't have this disease because people who have X disease are only of this, of this ethnic group. So I almost think that there's, there's another layer that we may have a problem, which is diagnosing people properly with these diseases. And so I guess my question was kind of going to be to both of you, Aditi and Regina about rare diseases, like do we really think we're informing people for them to get tested to find out they have the rare disease and then they would get access to the trials that are related to it? So if you guys, uh, either one of you can comment on that. I mean, I guess from a physician standpoint, people from my experience only find out that they have a rare disease if something goes wrong and they're going to their physician to actually get a diagnosis and then they end up finding out they have a rare disease. You know what I mean? So, and then it's from that point that the physician can then refer to the, uh, you know, refer that individual to the study. So, you know, they may not know that. But the bias of the physician. Yeah, it's the bias of the physician that I'm really uh, talking about. So what if a physician decides based on your symptoms, you probably have what, you know, the typical, you probably have diabetes, you probably have, you know, some kind of uh, metabolic syndrome, you have this, but if you dig deeper, you'll find that they have some of these rare diseases. So that was really where I was going, especially given the clinical center, because a lot of those rare diseases, what was your experience from there? Did you well, see a lot of yeah. minority subjects? I didn't see many. Well, actually, we did in our study. Again, I don't know if it's because uh, we made an extra effort or whatever, but we actually did have a nice representation uh, in, in the pediatric population. Uh, so in, in the clinical center, you know, keeping in mind that, pe you know, and, and as you know, people in the clinical center are there and you see them because they have been referred by their physician because they couldn't figure out what's going on. And therefore, they end up at the NIH Clinical Center to enter into a study. So um, by virtue of being there, they probably do have something that's either rare or intractable or something that cannot be handled in, in a typical scenario. Um, not sure about, so in terms of physician bias, um, I guess, you know, theoretically, we can all have bias to some degree. And, you know, I do think that there are many factors that play into how patients are referred to studies by physicians, um, whether they have a rare disease or whether the physician, you know, is what, you know, they're uninsured or underinsured. So therefore I'm not gonna necessarily refer them because, you know, their insurance is not gonna pay and they can't pay. So why am I wasting my time? Um, you know, those types of biases I have seen uh, in terms of more of a insurance status, uh, more of maybe a preconceived notion that um, they don't have time, uh, you know, those types of things I have seen and not necessarily specific to any particular race or ethnicity, just, you know, it might just be that individual and what their preconceived notions are about the population that they're working with, whether it be you know, kids or whether it be, you know, the elderly or whatever. So I, I do think that, you know, educating investigators uh, who are engaged in clinical research and clinical trials is important. That's why I say it's really a multi-layer. Um, you can't really point your finger at one. It really, it's like, you know, sponsor, investigator, community, and my dream world of, you know, you know who actually mandating <laughs> that it actually happens, you know. But I, I feel you. What, you were at the clinical center? I was mostly in uh, 36, uh, building 36. So uh, okay. mental health, but I'm an immunologist. So I was doing a lot of immunology um, oh, okay. studies. Okay, I like your picture in the background, by the way. <laughs> 
<laughs> Let's see what it looks like closer. <laughs> yeah. Well, think, everyone, thanks, that brings Regina. us to the... I just wanted to add, um, I think another point to it is like having specialty clinics. For example, I work in uh, rare diseases in neuroscience space and to diagnose a disease, you know, in a particular way until you do genetic testing. So there is, there could be a lot of stigma around it too um, in diagnosis of this. And then um, uh, like we have a great physician from MGH who works at our company. And when he tells me stories about there is a stigma of testing it and letting their patients know. And I'm not sure how, it, it could not be like a racial difference. It could be like what kind of access they have in terms of the specialty clinic and how confidently it, their symptoms can be assigned to a particular disease in absence of genetic testing because many people don't go for it in many scenario. Um, which is very important. So Sherry, when I was uh, listening to your question, it was reminding me uh, last month for Rare Disease Awareness Month, I saw the movie Dancing at the Vatican. And uh, it was really about it, like how uh, in some communities, a particular disease, it was about Huntington there, it could be a stigma. And there was a big move to bring it to Vatican and Pope has to say like, there is nothing wrong with you, it's just a disease. So. Um, yeah, there is, I think, a lot to be done. I, I do agree with Regina at um, different fronts. Yeah. Well, I have a question from the Black Women and Science and Engineering Group, and they would like to know, are you familiar with the Henrietta Lacks Act, and how can advocacy groups like BeWise work with CROs on this? Um, I'm familiar with the Henrietta Lacks Act, the Henrietta Lacks book. I've actually had an opportunity to meet some of the family members of Henrietta Lacks. And we did a Henrietta Lacks symposium at NIH. <laughs> That's, we did, you know, we did. Not. <laughs> we did. So, yeah, so um, how can advocacy, I think the question is how can advocacy groups get involved with us to in clinical or just in general about pharmaceutical companies? Maybe you can clarify that. Well, she's asking about getting involved and working with CROs. Okay, so we are a CRO. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let me just put in a plug, if you would like to follow up uh, with us, because that's one of the, 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 the things that we do in terms of a target. Uh, is uh, work with larger biopharmaceutical companies because we do have you know, inroads um, with different investigators and advocacy groups, et cetera. But uh, we would love to work with you. Um, and I'm sure you can provide the contact information. Um, also, our chief growth officer, Keith Toady, uh, would be an excellent person to really try to facilitate uh, sort of a follow up uh, connection here at Tuum Clinical. But um, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I will connect. Keith and Erica together. She's with Be Wise, and okay. Erica Keith is with Twin Clinical. So I'll get you two together. I have another question, Aida. If you mind, if I can share your email address with a few people on uh, in part of the program right now. Uh, yes, please. Uh, and it's Aida A I D A period S A B O at Parexel P A R E X E L dot com. And if any of you want to be part of the collaborative i can certainly send your name to the the person that's hosting it by the way one of the people that's leading this is is in um it's an organization in boston as well so i know a lot of you all are in boston so thank you for sharing that sure well i just sent your email address to uh, everyone <laughs> so make sure everyone has it. Don't spam her. She's very busy. She's out in California. No, no, no. I'm no, going to catch you. Please, please do. Please do. <laughs> well, that brings us to the top of the hour. There's so much more that we could talk about this. We're going to have to do a part two on this discussion. And I would, again, love to thank PTC Therapeutics for powering all of this for us for the month of June. They're great to work with. I would love to connect you with Janine Clemente if you have any questions about what their research is on and what the wonderful things that they're working on inside the communities. I am more than happy to do that. Thank you again for joining us and I look forward to seeing you. So let's talk a little preview about our next makeshift happen. 
That is going to be June 15th, and that is going to be with Third Rock Ventures. And we're going to talk about how the venture capital is part of bringing all of this together. So I do hope that you are able to join us on June 15th. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Thank you, Edie. Thank you for the invitation. Enjoy I your day. You. We love you, Edie. I love you guys. I miss you guys so much. <laughs> Bye. Bye.